have been going through the Hebrews 11 Faith Hall of Fame series. And last week we were talking about General Joshua, who led the people of Israel in the very first battle, actually, after we had left Egypt. And he had led the people of Israel in the battle against the Amalekites. If you turn with me back in the book of Exodus, chapter 17. It says, in verse number 8, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moshe said to Yehoshua, that's Joshua, choose men for us, go out and fight with Amalek. And tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with God's staff in my hand. And Yehoshua did as Moshe had told him and fought with Amalek. And then Moshe, Aharon, Hur went up to the top of the hill. And when Moshe raised his hands, Israel prevailed, but when he let it down, Amalek prevailed. However, Moshe's hands grew heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aharon and Hur held up his hands, the one on the one side and the one on the other, so that his hand stayed a munah. Now, in the Hebrew, the word emunah is from emun, and from that we get the word amen. This is the word that we get not only for faith, but for faithfulness. You see, biblical faith is not just a head knowledge. It's a faithfulness. So that the scripture goes on to say, he who endures to the end shall be what? Shall be saved. If you have a biblical faith, you will be faithful to the end. And so the way that Moses' hands were able to keep up was he had to have one man, Aaron, his, his brother, older brother, on one side, and Hur holding up his other hand on the other side so that his hands would stay faithful until sunset. As Moses' hands drooped, Amalek, the Amalekites, prevailed. As Moses' hands were lifted up, Israel prevailed. Sometimes when we're going through difficult times of our lives, it's hard to keep our hands up. It's at those times we need our brothers and our sisters in the Lord to help us keep our hands up. That's why the Lord provides us for each other. That's why we're known as mishpachah in the Hebrew, that's family. That's why the faith that we have is community faith. It isn't a faith where each individual goes off like the Marlboro man does in the commercial the self-sufficient Marlboro man who can just ride out into the sunset and take care of himself. The concept that we see found within the Word of God is that we are a body, we're a community. Yes, we're made out of individuals. I have two eyes, I have one nose, I have one mouth. I have ten fingers, I have ten toes, I have two feet, two legs, two arms. You see, Paul talks about that in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, that though we are one body, we are with many parts. And here we see how Moses needed Aaron and Hur to keep his hands up while Joshua actually fought the battle. And as General Joshua fights the battle, as Moses' hands are raised faithfully by Aaron and Hur, I need you folks to help me to keep going. Sometimes it's very frustrating because, you know, even the scripture says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I assure you, there are times that I feel like giving up. But for the errands and the hers of this congregation who help keep my hands raised, because you see the battle in this 
story in Exodus chapter 17, yes, though it be a physical battle, battle against the physical people, the Amaleks, the Amalekites, yet we can see within it a spiritual battle as well. Because as the scripture says, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers. We're dealing with not just a physical enemy, we're dealing with a spiritual enemy as well. Amalek represents that spiritual enemy. And we need one another, folks. We need to hang in there with each other. Because what we're seeing in here is that Amalek didn't come to battle with the soldiers of Israel. He did not come to battle with the fighting men. He came to battle with the handicapped. He came to battle with the women and the children. He came to battle with the stragglers. You see, Satan wants to get us when we're down. Satan wants to get us when we feel handicapped. Satan wants us to give up and to defeat us. But we see because Aaron and her, because we as part of the body of Messiah hold each other's hands up, we go through these things, we see now in verse number 13 how Joshua then, by the way, the name Yeshua is an abbreviated form of the Hebrew Yehoshua, where we get the name Jesus. It's Yehoshua that defeats Amalek, putting their people to the sword. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we have the end of the book. That you knew the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. You knew exactly what was going to happen. Lord, you knew that we needed each other in this spiritual battle. You knew that we needed brothers and sisters that would hold our hands up, that would defend us as necessary as we go to battle against Amalek, the adversary. So you provided within the body of Messiah people, brothers, sisters, who have the faith in Yeshua that we do. Lord, recognizing that none of us by ourselves is righteous. There is none righteous, no, not one. But Lord, you are and you impute your righteousness, as the Brit Hadashah says to us, because of what Yeshua did for us. So Lord, as we now look at the story of Purim, even though in the book of Esther we don't even see your name mentioned once, yet we see in the book of Esther how you defeated the enemy behind the scenes. Lord, we need to realize that even if we don't see you, you're still there. Lord, we need to realize that as we go through the battle, you're still there. As we go through the fire, even as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Lord, even Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fire, and there was a fourth, and he was the Son of God. Lord, even through the fire, you're still there. So, Lord, as we look at the story of Purim and then we read from the book of Esther, Lord, today, tonight, Lord, we pray that you will show us that no matter what it looks like in the flesh, Lord, that you will provide the victory. We just need to be assured because of your word and have faith in it, the emunah, Lord, to believe that what you say will come to pass. And when we look at that last chapter in the book of Revelation, to understand that the victory is ours because of our faith in you. Or better yet, we could say, the victory is all yours. And Lord, you bring us along with you because of our faith in you and in your word. And we bless you in Yeshua's name. And all God's people said, we're going to be talking about Purim today. Last Shabbat, we saw, as I just read, that God allowed us to experience our first taste of war. In Deuteronomy 25, 17 through 19, which I did not read, 
But I had mentioned that Amalek had attacked those who were in the rear, those who were exhausted and straggling behind, those who were tired and weary because Amalek did not fear God. God reminds Israel of this, just as we're about to go into the promised land under Yehoshua. He says, remember what Amalek did to you on the road as you were coming out of Egypt, how he met you by the road, attacked those in the rear, those who were exhausted and straggling behind when you were tired and weary. He did not fear God. And as I shared last Shabbat, as we left Egypt, a band of the descendants of Esau, that's the Amalekites, Attract, I mean, attack, excuse me, the stragglers of Israel. He didn't go after the warriors, he went after the stragglers, even as we followed the cloud through the wilderness. You were leading us, and yet, even with your cloud being there, Amalek was not afraid. He came after our stragglers. You see, Amalek, as I talked about last week, attacks those who can't keep up. What military importance are the stragglers? What strategic value are the stragglers? Defeating and killing Israelite soldiers in battle, that's one thing, but the women and the children, the famished and the weary, those who can't hurt you, those who are no threat, what's the purpose of killing them? They're just helpless women, children the handicapped and the weary. I talked about this last week because this is what the Nazis did and this is also what we're going to be seeing about what Haman did in the kingdom of Persia. That in order to be able to be capable of killing them, that is the women, the children, the handicapped and the weary, you have to depersonalize them. Now it's a fact and in the early days of euthanasia, the T4 program of the Nazis. In the early days of that program, they took the mentally handicapped and the physically handicapped and they euthanized them in what they called a very humane way. That's what that word euthanasia means. It's a kind, gentle death. That's what it means. But eventually, it was just a little bit too personal because the doctors were administrating that. It was a little too personal. And then they tried another methodology where they would have the victim come in, whether they be Jewish or handicapped or a gypsy or Jehovah's Witness or somebody who wasn't them. And that victim would sit in a chair and one of the doctors or medical personnel would take a syringe with a huge needle, stick it through the ribs into the heart of the victim and inject a lethal dose of poison. Then there was another methodology that they tried to do, and this is where they were shooting the victims. In Russia, it was Babi Yar, where the killing of the grandmothers were. In other places, what they would do is have men, women, and children stripped down to nakedness, run into a trench, and then they would shoot them down. You see, in order to be able to kill people like that, you have to have a hard heart. You have to look down on these people as if they're not really people. And the propaganda machine of Joseph Goebbels, the chief propagandist of Nazi Germany, was this. They had movies that showed Jews as being rats. They had movies showing the incapacitated and the handicapped as being less than human because Germany looked at themselves as being the master race, and any other groups were untermenschen, under people. In order to be able to kill people, you have to depersonalize them. And you know what the failing? Why did they have to go to the gas chambers? Because any of the other methodology was a little bit too personal, and it started to affect their soldiers mentally really bad. Our soldiers come back from combat often with PTSD because of the things that they see and experience. Well, these Nazi soldiers were the same. So the gas chambers were viewed and the death camps were viewed as the most humane way to put to death 
millions. And yet, to try to keep the sanity of those who were implementing the death machines. In order to do that, you have to depersonalize people. You have to dehumanize them. You have to make them, in your mind, different. And you have to kill them, in this case of Amalek, because they're Jews, because they're different, because they're not you. Now, we see this happening to the Jewish people throughout history in Purim, which we're going to be celebrating tonight, in the Inquisition, in the pogroms. If you ever watch Fiddler on the Roof, you know what I'm talking about. And then in the Shoah, the Holocaust. Depersonalizing people are what the bad guys do to good people. How can it be that Dr. Pettit's daughters, and this was in Connecticut some years ago, a good man, Dr. Pettit, his wife was tied up, he was tied up, he was bound. His wife was told, go to the bank, withdraw all this money, and we'll leave and leave your family alone. But then these two bad guys had gone ahead and said, well, there's a lot more we can do, we might as well. So they raped the mother and the daughters numerous times before they set the house on fire, and he just barely managed to escape. Bad guys look at other people as not being real people, but as them as objects for their own use. So I postulate that in order for the Amalekites to kill these stragglers, the mothers, the children, and the handicapped, and the old folks, they had to dehumanize them too. That's why Amalek did this with all the Israelite stragglers as we left Egypt. So in short, Amalek attacks and kills the other simply because they are the other. Even today, the Arabs will go ahead and say, we're going to kill every Jew behind every single tree. And they depersonalize Jews. What, it doesn't matter if they're children, women, men, it doesn't matter. They will kill whole families. Now, you wonder, who is Amalek? We talked about the Amalekites there in the book of Exodus. Our Lord talks about the Amalekites and what they did to us as we left Egypt. But who is Amalek? And why did he have such a hatred against Israel, the descendants of Jacob? Well, the answer is found even in Scripture. We're going to talk about that for a moment. And the question is, why would Amalek go all the way out of its way to attack and kill the stragglers and the descendants of Jacob, even though they were far, far away from the Hebrews? They were under no threat from Israel as we left Egypt. So let's answer the first question, who is Amalek? Well, Amalek was Esau's grandson. If you go to the book of Brashit, Genesis chapter 36, here's the genealogy of Esau. Esau is the brother of Jacob, Yaakov. And as you know, Jacob doesn't mean deceiver. Jacob means heel grabber. Jacob uh, bought, if you will, or should I say Esau sold for a pottage of porridge, sold his birthright as firstborn. Esau was the firstborn. He should have received the double portion. He should have received the blessing. And it says the genealogy of Esau, Esau chose Canaanite women as his wives. Adah, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. And Adah bore to Esau Eliphaz. The sons of Eliphaz were Taman, Omar, Tebo, Katam, and Kenaz. Now I wanted to talk just for a moment about Kenaz because this is where Caleb descends from. Now Caleb is one of the twelve spies that were sent in to spy the land and he was sent out from the tribe of Judah. His father, Caleb's father, had attached himself to the tribe of Judah and his father was a Kenazite. But it's very interesting, on the one hand, a descendant of Esau, which is Amalek, who is the son of Eliphaz, and yet, on the other hand, here's another grandson of Esau, that was Kenaz, who was actually the ancestor of 
Caleb. How different. On the one hand, you have Caleb who's fighting for Judah. And Judah, by the way, is where we get the name Jew from. And then you've got Amalek who's fighting just the opposite side of the coin against Judah or Israel. So Amalek is the grandson of Esau who had sold his birthright for a pot of lentils to his brother Yaakov. And when Esau also lost his inheritance to Yaakov, Esau hated Jacob and vowed to kill him. You see that in Genesis 27:41. It says Esau hated his brother because of the blessing his father had given him. Esau said to himself, the time for mourning my father will soon come and then I will kill my brother Yaakov. In other words, before too long, dad's going to die. And then I will kill Jacob. But Esau couldn't kill his brother Jacob. Even when Jacob returns after 20 years away with Uncle Laban and goes ahead and meets with Esau, and Esau comes with 400 men from Edom, the Edomites. 400 men comes up to meet with Jacob. Well, the intent was not a nice welcoming committee. The whole idea was to get Jacob to come on down with him. And I'm kind of wondering what in the world did Esau have in mind bringing 400 warriors to greet his brother? Hmm. But the Midrash, and by the way, I wanted to emphasize that this is non-canonical. In other words, the Midrash, that means stories. Non-canonical, that means it's not scripture. The Midrash has a story about this. Now, I don't hold Midrashim as being scripture. Don't assume that. The Midrash says a story that Esau teaches his grandson Amalek to hate and pursue Jacob and his descendants, the Israelites. That term Midrash, and in the plural it means, and it said Midrashim, they're stories. Or Drash, you know, I can sometimes do and will do a Darash, which is a commentary on a piece of scripture that I've read. If I'm going to do a Darash on the Parsha, I would have started talking about the Torah portion that we had read today. Drash means to do a commentary. Midrash simply means to investigate or study or to exposit. Now that is kind of like what you get today if you read a Christian commentary. You go down to the Christian bookstore, you want to study out a certain part of the Bible, you go get a commentary on it. That's kind of what we're talking about here. And in the Midrash, it goes ahead and tells the story that goes beyond what the Bible actually says to us and tries to fill in the gaps left, left in the biblical narrative. So there's a Midrash on Genesis 27:41. So if you go back with me to Genesis 27, you're going to see this is where, after Jacob comes back, after he's wrestled with the angels, excuse me, 2741, I'm sorry, wrong. This is before Jacob even goes for 20 years. 20 years later, he comes back. But it's because of Esau's hatred that's what this Midrash is from. Uh, because of Esau's hatred for Jacob, that this story is built. Genesis twenty-seven forty-one, where it says, Esau hated his brother because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau said to himself, the time for mourning my father will soon come, and I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, the Midrash, or the story that goes beyond this, says, I tried to kill Jacob, but was unable. He was trying to kill Jacob even before Jacob left for Uncle Laban, but I guarantee you that after Jacob comes back after 20 years, after Jacob goes ahead and meets with his brother in Genesis chapter 32, we see with Esau coming with 400 soldiers that it was not out of simple greeting and kindness that he goes ahead and brings these soldiers. He's still trying to kill Jacob 20 years later. Esau calls in Amalek and says, now I'm entrusting you and your descendants with the important mission of annihilating Jacob's descendants, the Jewish people. 
carry out this deed for me. Be relentless, do, do not show mercy. So we see Amalek repeatedly trying to destroy the Jewish people. Amalek fought against Israel at Rephidim, as we just read in Exodus 17, and where the Lord says, who did they come after? They came after the stragglers. They came after the handicapped. They came after the tired and weary. Even though Amalek lived in a far-off land from where the Hebrews were and wasn't under any threat at all from Israel. Now, historically, if you follow history, you'll see that Amalek has often had enmity against Israel. They've always appeared as hostile toward Israel. In Judges 3.13, along with Eglon of the Moabites and the Midianites as well, they fought against Israel. Psalm 83, verse 7 refers to both occasions. Now, it's kind of interesting that this is all in the family. Esau was the brother of Jacob, right? So, the Amalekites, being a descendant of Esau, are relatives not only to Jacob, but they're also relatives to the Ammonites and the Moabites. Now, Ammon and Moab, you know whose kids these two are? Lots. You remember with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot had to flee, so he went to a cave. And the daughters thought, all of mankind are dead, so therefore we're going to get our father drunk, have sex with him, and have children. There's the Ammonites. There's the Moabites. But there's another relative in a way here, and that is the Midianites. Who did Moses marry? A Moabitess. Zipporah. Zipporah means bird. He married a bird from Midian. So we're dealing with all in the family stuff here. Isn't this interesting? All these relatives fighting against all these other relatives. Now, come to think of it, isn't that where we are in human nature sometimes? Are there not family members who don't talk to other family members because of something? Yeah. You know, the Hatfields and the McCoys in the United States of America? There was a lot of intermarriage between these two families, and yet they were killing each other. A lot of intermarriage around here, and yet what? They're killing each other. But this enmity is also the background of the command of the Lord to King Saul. That's the reading that we just did today. So if you go with me to 1 Samuel 15, which I read just a few moments before, we see that King Saul is commanded to go ahead and destroy Amalek. Remember that? About a half an hour ago. I read that, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing now. But God says to Samuel to say to King Saul, destroy Amalek. Don't spare them. Kill both man and woman, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. So at the time God commands Saul to wipe out the Amalekites, we can safely assume that their sins have ripened. Now, do you remember when God promised in Genesis chapter 15 the land to Abraham and his descendants? And he said that your descendants are going to be in a land that's not yours for 400 years. And then when they come back, they're going to go ahead and come back into the land. And when they come back into the land, then there will be the battle against the Amori. If you go with me to Genesis 15, and I'm going to talk more about that next Shabbat, I'm only going to touch upon it just for a moment. If you go to verse number 16 of Genesis chapter 15, it says, Only in the fourth generation will your descendants come back here, because only then will the Amori, or the Amorite, will be ripe for punishment. In other words, God has appointed a time that there would be judgment upon these people. But it wasn't at the time of the life of Abraham. And it wasn't during the time of the life of Isaac. And it wasn't the time during the life of Jacob. And it wasn't the time 
during 300 and some odd years later, when we've been in captivity in Egypt, it was after we get back that the judgment time for the Amorites was ripe. Now these Amalekites, by the time you're over at King Saul, you're dealing with hundreds of years after we came back into the land. And so therefore, their sins too will have ripened because they're amongst the people in the land of Canaan that are, as God said, sinners. Next week, talk more about that. You know, sooner or later, God, even in his grace and his loving compassion, sooner or later, God says, enough. It's ripened. The cup is full. And now comes judgment. Peter talks about that. More about that next week. But now the judgment that God says for King Saul to put upon Amalek was disobeyed by King Saul. So King Saul failed to obey the command which cost him his kingship as we read in 1 Samuel 15. Because King Saul spared King Agag of the Amalekites and it is entirely possible that King Saul spared not just Agag, the king, but other members of the Amalekite royal house or at least let them escape. Now, how do I get into that? Well, because of the story of Purim. You see, a later event, which is what we're celebrating tonight at sunset, a later event in the Bible indicates that's exactly what had to have happened. In other words, not only did Saul spare King Agag, but he had to allow somebody from Agag's family to leave, to escape. And this is why we have the story of Purim. Because if you go to Esther chapter 3, verse 1, and we're going to be reading the book of Esther in just a few minutes, and I think the kids are going to try to act out the book, <laughs> even without a Haman, Haman or Mordecai, unless somebody wants to up and uh, volunteer to the position, Good. Which one are you going to be, Haman or Mordecai? The bad one is Haman. You'll be Haman. All right. Usually I end up being the Haman, and I end up getting everybody booing at me. So anyway, anyway, we're going to be over there at Esther. But Agag, King Agag, is the ancestor of this man named Haman, who's the antagonist in the story of Purim. Had King Saul not spared Agag... Haman would not have existed to destroy Israel. Yet, it's interesting that this fulfills a prophecy found in Exodus 17, 16. Remember after the battle against Amalek by Joshua in Exodus chapter 17, where Aaron and Hur are holding up Moses' hands? Listen to what it says. God says to Moses in verse 14 of chapter 17 of Exodus, write this in a book to be remembered, and tell it to Joshua, I will completely blot out any memory of Amalek from under heaven. So Moshe built an altar, called it Adonai Nisi, the Lord is my banner or miracle. And he, he said, that is the Lord said, because their hand, the Amalekites' hand, was against the throne of Yah, that's God himself. The Amalekites had no fear of God. Their hand was against God himself by coming against Israel. Then God says, I will fight against Amalek generation after generation. Isn't that interesting? You see, the only way that the generational battle could continue is for a descendant of Agag, or excuse me, of Amalek to still be around. It is said in the Talmudic writings, which again, not canonical, not scripture. But it is said that some of the descendants of Agag, some of the descendants, that is, of Amalek, went to this land called Germania, which we call Germany. 
Very interesting statement found within the Talmud because then it would indicate that at least some of those during the Nazi regime were from Amalek and that the battle continues. Now the word Purim for tonight. Purim is actually masculine pur, uh, plural. The word Pur means lot, singular. Purim, lots. And we get that from Esther chapter 3. So after the Persian king, Ahasuerus, it's hard to say that at this time of the day, promoted, promoted Haman the son of Hamdada the Agagite, that's from Agag, for advancement. It says everyone would bow down before Haman except for Mordecai, who would neither kneel nor bow down to him. And after the king's people confronted Mordecai a number of times without his paying attention to them, they told Haman... Boo, yes. In order to find out whether Mordecai's explanation that he was a Jew would suffice to justify his behavior. Now Haman was furious when he saw Mordecai was not kneeling and bowing down to him. Upon learning what the people Mordecai belonged to, it seemed to him, that is to Haman, a waste to lay hands on Mordecai alone. In other words, hey, here's the best opportunity I've ever got. Instead of just taking on Mordecai, I'm going to take on all the Jews. So he destroyed it. Destroyed, he decided to just edit that out. He decided to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole of Ahasuerus' kingdom. So who was Haman? Haman was a descendant of Agag, who was a descendant of Amalek, the grandson of Esau, the brother of Jacob. Haman did what his ancestors had done with the Jewish people in the wilderness. He destroyed, he tried to destroy them all. Men, women, and children. Same thing. Father to son to son to son to son to son. And he used the they are not like us reasoning, as did his ancestors, depersonalizing the Jewish people. Now I want to get to why did I spend so much time on that last week? I'm tying it back to last week. The depersonalizing of a group of people. You have blue eyes. Well, so do I. No? Green. <laughs> Well, anyone with green eyes is less than those who have blue. <laughs> Let's see if I'm outnumbered. How many of us have blue? <laughs> okay. Well, we don't have a lot of us, so I'll keep my mouth shut. Anyway, moving on. The depersonalization. I, won't, I wanted to talk about that because this ties in with what I talked about last week. Listen to the next few words from the book of Esther. Listen. You'll see it right here. Esther chapter 3, verse 8. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a particular people scattered and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Now what is he doing? He's causing the king to focus on one particular group of people. Their laws... Their laws as opposed to ours. You see the difference? He's starting to make a distinction. We versus they. Their laws are different from those of every other people. Moreover, they don't observe the king's laws. It doesn't befit the king to tolerate them. If it please the king, have a decree written for their destruction. If it pleases the king have a decree written for their destruction. This group of people in your kingdom, they don't follow after your laws. They're different. So let's destroy them. The king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamdada, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, the money is given to you and the people too to do with as it seems good to you. Letters were sent by a courier to all the royal provinces to destroy, kill, and to exterminate all Jews from young to old, including the small children and women. 
on a specific day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, which begins at sunset tonight, since Hebrew days start at sunset and end at sunset, and to seize their goods as plunder. That day became known as Purim, and the reason why is because that date was chosen by drawing of lots, or Pur. It's interesting to note in the book of Esther that there's no mention of God's name whatsoever. In fact, to put the book of Esther into the canon of the Old Testament, as we call it, in the Tanakh, the rabbis had to determine whether or not it was God's hand in that book or not. Now, normally you look at it, a book in the Bible, and if you see God's name in there, then you say, oh, this could be one of them. But this book doesn't even have a single mention of God's name at all. So the conclusion that I can run into to see the miraculous outcome was that God worked behind the scenes in the story of Queen Esther, known by her Hebrew name as Hadassah. Now, it's really an interesting story because, you see, yesterday the sky was all cloudy and it was raining and it was snowing at the same time, a heavy snow and stuff like that. You know, it gets to you after a while. But written down in a basement of a home that was destroyed during World War II was an interesting statement that says, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. And I believe in love even when I don't see it. And I believe in God, even though I don't see his hand visibly at work. I'm paraphrasing. Let me, let me explain this. We need to understand that just because we don't think we see God, and we don't, in an overt act, in fire coming down from heaven, doesn't mean God isn't at work. Doesn't mean that God hasn't set up situations. Because Queen Esther, as we'll note, didn't become Queen Esther. <laughs> I know. Until Queen Vashti refused to obey the king's order. So then the king had to go looking for another queen. So he looked throughout all the kingdom and had all the virgins come. And then he determined about Esther and said, yep, she's the one. You see? So who brought this little lowly Jewish girl up to the, the rank of queen? It was God working behind the scenes. Here's Esther. She's an orphan. She was raised by her uncle Mordecai. Her uncle, after her parents' death, instructed Esther not to divulge her Jewishness when she went in to meet the king. Every day, Mordecai walked by the court and asked after his niece, checking up on her, making sure she's okay. And Esther impressed everyone who met her, including the king, so she was elevated to queen. And upon learning of Haman's plot... Mordecai tore his clothes, wore sackcloth and ashes, and walked through the city crying loudly. And when Esther heard of Mordecai's display, she dispatched a messenger to discover what was troubling her uncle. What's wrong, uncle? Well, Mordecai recounts the details of the evil decree and instructed Esther to intercede on the Jews' behalf. This was not a simple request because you don't appear before the king at that day without being summoned. And she hadn't been summoned for 30 days. And if she just simply appeared before the king, she could die. Esther chapter 4, verse 12. Upon being told what Esther had said, Mordecai asked them to give Esther this answer. Don't suppose that merely because you happen to be in the royal palace that you will escape any more than the other Jews. For if you fail to speak up now, relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from a different direction. Can God raise somebody else? You betcha he can. 
He could have raised somebody other than Moses, couldn't have he? Yep. He could have raised somebody other than Bruce, couldn't have he? You betcha. Even more. But the thing is, we have to be willing when God tells us to do something. So through Mordecai, Esther is being told, deliverance will come to the Jews because God had promised to the descendants of Jacob many promises. And Mordecai is quite well aware of that. But you and your father's family will perish. Who knows whether you didn't come into your royal position precisely for such a time as this. Now I often wonder why was I born in this time, in this year, 1951, by the way. I'm not a newborn, I'm 61 years old. But why was I born in this country, in this era? You know, I ask myself that sometimes. And one of the things that I look at and say, you know, I'm thankful for is, uh, you know, where I could go into a shower and just turn a little knob and then the water comes down. Or I can go to the restroom and hit the flush button and the flush flushes. You know, the concept of living a hundred some years ago where we didn't have those amenities, uh, I'm not really excited about. I had a little bit of that taste in boot camp, in Marine Corps boot camp, where you had to do a slit trench and where you had to wash yourself other ways than you want to talk about. So... I wouldn't have liked to have been born over a hundred years ago where we didn't have all these things like electricity and stuff. So I th I'm thankful that I'm raised at such a time as this because I have those things. But realize this, power goes out more often than we realize, especially where I happen to live. And all these amenities for us can end just like that, just like they did to other people. So my point being here is, God has brought us into a position here. We have a calling to be lights in this world now. We have been called at this time, in this era, in this place, to be doing what God has called us to do. Just like Esther was raised to that position for precisely such a time as this. Now, Esther goes back and returns, returns the answer to Mordecai. She says, Go, assemble all the Jews to be found in Shushan, and have them fast for me, neither eating or drinking, for three days, nights, and a day. And I and the girls attending me will fast the same way. Then I will go into the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now there are times that we as believers, just like Queen Esther had to do, if it's in the sense of righteousness, sometimes we have to break man-made laws to accomplish the purposes. It's not like the ends justify the means, but for Esther to be an instrument of saving her people, the job needed to be done before that day on the 13th of Adar. And she needed to go into the king, and even though she risked her life and violated the law of the land, She's taking that in stride and saying, well, if I perish, I perish. And Mordecai went his way and did everything Esther ordered him to do. And as we shall soon read, and which I will now abbreviate, Esther approaches the king. She's granted access. The king asks, what do you want? And she asks for him and Haman to come to a banquet. She will prepare for them. At the banquet, banquet, King Ahasuerus asked his wife again, What do you want? And she answers, If I found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. We'll be reading in a moment Esther 7, verse 3. In Esther 8, it says in verse 5, If it pleases the king, if I have won his favor, and if the matter seems right to the king, and if I have his approval, then let an order be written, rescinding the letters devised by Haman, <laughs> the son of Hamdada the Agagite, 
which he wrote to destroy the Jews in all the royal provinces. For how can I bear to see the disaster that will overcome my people? And how can I endure seeing the extermination of my kinsmen? And King Ahasuerus said to Esther, the queen, and Mordecai, the Jew, listen, I gave Esther the house of Haman, and they hanged him on the gallows because he threatened the lives of the Jews. You should issue a decree in the king's name for whatever you want concerning the Jews and seal it with the king's signet ring. Now listen to this closely, because there are laws in other countries. There are laws that are different than our laws, necessarily. And in this case, Persian law was this. Once a decree was written in the king's name and sealed with the signet of the king's ring, it cannot be rescinded even by the king himself. He cannot rescind a law that was already established by him. In other words, what Queen Esther was being told is, I can't do away with it, it's law. And law is law. And they're going to be coming at you. Because they were given the decree to destroy all men, women, and children, and I cannot rescind it, and no one else can rescind it. But, though the previous decree by Haman Thank you. Issued by the king could not be changed, even by the king himself. What did the king say? Do another decree issued in my name. That decree changed the outcome of the previous decree. I can't do away with the previous decree, is what he said. But issue another decree that will countermand the previous decree decree. Thus, because of Queen Esther's intervention, the Jewish people on that day were given by decree of the king. Here it is. What was that new decree? Permission to fight against their enemies, i.e. self-defense, and to defeat them. Esther chapter 8, 11 says, the letter said that the king had granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and defend their lives by destroying, killing, and exterminating any forces of any people or province that would attack them. I.e., if they come at you to destroy you, this new decree says what? Fight back. You can destroy them because they're coming against you. And your little ones, and your women, and your goods. On the designated day in any of the provinces of King Ahasuerus, namely the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. So a copy of the edict was to be issued as a decree in every province and proclaimed to all the peoples, and the Jews were to be ready on that day to take vengeance against their enemies. For the Jews, all was light, gladness, joy, and honor. In every province and city where the king's order and decree arrived, the Jews had gladness and joy a feast and a holiday. Many from the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews had overcome them. Now, if I'm going to try to give a, a relatively recent example that never happened, by the way, let's just say that Adolf Hitler had issued a decree that all Jews were going to be exterminated. By the way, it was never on paper. That's one of the things Hitler did very well. He never put it on paper. And oftentimes they talked in euphemisms, in other words, the final solution. You know, it sounds relatively harmless. There was a lot more behind that. But just imagine that if Hitler gave a decree to exterminate all the Jews and then suddenly had a change of heart but couldn't change the previous decree and then made another decree saying, well, all these Jews now could fight against those who were coming against them. That would be kind of tatament to the same thing, but it never happened. And six million Jews perished in the Holocaust. But by the way, so did another six million of those who were non-Jewish, that were Christian or Jehovah's Witnesses or other people, they were handicapped, they perished as well. We're only talking 12 million of non-combatants. Non-combatants means they weren't the soldiers. 
when you start to include all those who perished in the war itself, we go far, far beyond that. But here we see now the Jews were allowed to fight against those who were going to come against them. And in Esther chapter 9, it says, The time approached for the king's order and decree to be carried out, the day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to overpower them. But as it turned out, the opposite took place. The Jews overpowered those who hated them. Thus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the Jews assembled in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to attack anyone who tried to do them harm. And no one was able to withstand them because all the people were afraid of them. And the Jews put all their enemies to the sword. There was great slaughter and destruction as they did whatever they wanted to those who hated them. Thank you.